like to very much welcome Sarah Ellis and, and Fabio, Fabio Galvanini to this session. Um, just a quick word on each of them. Sarah is currently working as Senior Manager Assessment Services Europe for Cambridge Assessment English. She's based in Bologna, Italy. Sarah is interested in assessment, learning and professional development and has an extensive background in teaching, teacher training, assessment and exam management. She has trained teachers on CELTA and DELTA courses and is currently involved in the Cambridge Assessment English Teacher Support Program, which provides information, materials and support for teachers and academic directors. She's particularly interested in supporting teachers in developing digital skills and assessment literacy. Fabio, meanwhile, has taught English for about 10 years in India, England and Spain, after an MA degree in Asian Studies and Applied Linguistics. After starting to work with Cambridge in 2014, he's been involved in providing support, training and guidance to teachers and schools across Italy before moving into his current role as Cambridge Exams Publishing Product Manager, focusing on Cambridge English preparation materials for the Italian market and collaboration with Cambridge Assessment English. And so, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Sarah and Fabio. Over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you very You're much, ready. Eric, for that nice introduction. And welcome and hello uh, to everyone. And thank you very much for joining this session. Um, in these times of school closures, remote learning and limited access to schools and learning, going back to school this year is particularly challenging. And, and going back to school in whatever form that might be, whether that's face-to-face, -face, online, hybrid, etc., means that teachers and students around the world are facing some extra challenges this year. And this is really as a consequence of what I like to call uneven learning and teaching, which has created gaps and differences um, between our learners in a greater way than would perhaps be under normal circumstances. So in this session, Fabio and I are going to look at the context and think about the challenges and see how we can turn some of those challenges also into opportunities. We want to look at the importance of creating and nurturing the right mindset to make sure that learning is happening in the best circumstances and that everyone is getting the fullest involvement. We'll also look briefly at the role of assessment and how that can play a key role at the beginning of the year, but also throughout the year in ways of encouraging learning and making sure that we can see it from the teacher's perspective and the learner's perspective. And then we're going to look also at the role of our students and learners and see how they can work together, collaborate and support each other. So, right. that's a bit of context, Fabio. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Uh, just to introduce the context in a very visual way and also to take into consideration what you said, obviously there have been differences worldwide, but uh, this uh, graph taken from a very recent United Nations publication shows us the extent, uh, the length uh, and the quantity of uh, how children have been affected by school closure all around the world. And actually, um, we, we see that uh, for over three months, uh, over 90% of schools across the globe were closed and over 90% of learners were, um, were unable to, to attend uh, lessons normally. Some of them will have attended online, not uh, all kids around the world, uh, unfortunately, could do that. Uh, we see that also there are differences in how uh, higher income countries have been affected uh, as compared to middle or lower income countries. So uh, the orange line there shows us uh, that uh, actually middle and lower income countries are unfortunately being affected even harder. However, altogether, um, this document uh, was published in August uh, and it goes up to 15th of July, shows us that more or less uh, over 50% um, of kids around the world uh, couldn't actually attend the live lessons in the way they did. And uh, so we need to now acknowledge that there is something that we need to do to catch up with all of that. Yes, indeed. In fact, uh, as you say, the, the impact of those months of lockdown mean that some students have been more successful than others at learning. 
possibly because they've had better access to the internet or perhaps they've had more opportunity to use digital devices. But it does mean that this digital divide and also learning divide is a consequence. So that, that on the other side, some learners have actually benefited from uh, remote learning and have actually blossomed. So there are um, some good things that we can learn from the lockdown situation that hopefully we can take back into the, the new classroom as we um, are going to find it. So, but teachers really have to find the, identify those gaps and to look at where students have been disadvantaged, how are we going to catch up? How are we going to catch up and do continue with new work as well? So some students have actually become more autonomous um, because they've been learning at a distance, but others haven't. So there are lots of things that we need to balance in looking at these gaps. Now, the important thing, of course, is going back to school. We need to make sure that we optimize various um, aspects of our work. And of course, time management is going to be particularly challenging because maybe we have the same amount of content to cover and perhaps more because of those gaps created down, uh, created in lockdown. Um, so we need to really think about how we use time, looking at what we need to do in the classroom perhaps and what we can do outside the classroom. Um, I think if we just try to do what we've always done, we're not going to find a solution. So I think it is an opportunity to rethink how we use time. The other thing we need to optimize is our use of resources. Many of you may be fortunate to have a, um, good course book material with lots of supporting material, but perhaps it's a time to review what material there is to really make sure that we know what the resources uh, are in our course books are available. And if not, also to look at the free resources, some of which we're going to um, show you, which may help you in your different circumstances. There's plenty of um, uh, teaching materials available um, also freely online um, to supplement any course book materials you may be looking at. But perhaps the most important resource are our students and we really need to make sure that we're optimizing how we work with our students, how they work um, themselves, make sure that teachers are giving them feedback on their progress, particularly um, when we've looked at the gaps that maybe some of them have, so that they, we can encourage them to see that yes, okay, it's not too late, we need to address it, but we can and we can also move forward. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. So let's, uh, let's get practical and let's think, so uh, many of us uh, will be about to go back to school. Some of us have just uh, done that uh, and uh, unfortunately some uh, other countries some other situations, people will still be learning online. However, a very important first thing to consider and to address with our learners is uh, the mindset. So we need to make sure we set the right mindset in our classrooms. And uh, we're gonna look at uh, an idea, some ideas actually, on how we, we can do that with our students, uh, regardless of whether we're doing that online, in a blended context or setup, or hopefully back in a physical classroom, although socially, socially distanced. Uh, so let's have a look at the, at the negativity, the first one. Uh, the first thing I suggest is uh, we put students uh, in groups. But of course, I can hear you whispering groups in a social distance classroom. Isn't that going to be a problem? But Sarah can tell you something about that. Yes, I mean, there are some challenges that teachers need to face and um, the idea of sharing some ideas and resources here. We've got some tips and for, uh, for the socially distanced classroom. And one in particular is about pair work and group work. We appreciate that everybody's circumstances may be different, but we hope some of these practical ideas may um, help you in your situation. So where they are having to work in uh, socially distanced situations, obviously space is going to be very important and uh, obviously recognizing that that will change the way they're communicating because they may have to speak more loudly or they may have to take turns in the way they communicate. Um, but we can turn that into an opportunity. So for example, uh, we can get students to practice conversation repair strategies because they haven't really heard very well. So maybe asking for clarification or repetition. So something very practical. Also other suggestions for dealing with space 
Again, that would obviously depend on your furniture, but some of these may um, be applicable to your situation. So going back to groups, Fabio. Yeah, sure. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we're going to be showing you in a second a QR code uh, uh, from which you can access the resources I was talking about. There will also be a QR code summing up all of the resources we'll be talking about in the final slide of our presentation. So uh, after we've put students in groups uh, in the way that uh, the circumstances allow us to do, so find the best fit, use that resource that Sarah was showing you to get practical ideas on how to best group your students. And that can include uh, grouping them online. Students can still work in groups uh, even if they're doing that remotely. So the second thing we want our students to do is to uh, identify challenges that they or people they know have faced or may still be facing uh, so over the last few months. And we're speaking here especially, of course, about learning challenges. Those could, be, uh, could have been affected by external circumstances and could be uh, an extremely variety and, and a great range of different challenges. So we just want our students to acknowledge those um, so that we are all aware of, of, of where we are and also how we can improve our situation and how we can move forward in the best way possible. So the next step uh, will be to get uh, our students to discuss how the challenges they've identified could be overcome and how uh, other learners may support uh, in overcoming those challenges. Also, how the teacher could support in overcoming those challenges. Uh, after having done that, uh, we, we will want uh, somehow to elicit or to anyway bring into the conversation some key values and key behaviors such as, such as empathy. Understanding each other will be key to uh, grouping back together as, as a class, as a collective uh, learning team. And uh, um, behaviors such as collaboration will play a key role in helping us optimize, optimizing both time management and learning as well. Right, so uh, as we've brought this into the conversation, uh, we, we will then want to uh, uh, get each group to, to share these challenges and, and also uh, the way the solutions they find, uh, found to overcome those challenges. And uh, we may want to ask them uh, to explicitly link these to key values and behaviors we've identified what we mentioned earlier. Um, we, we recognize that obviously we're talking to um, you know, a very uh, wide audience. So uh, some of the things that we're saying may or may not be applicable to different cultural uh, backgrounds, also to different age levels and uh, age and levels. So for example, if we're uh, talking about uh, maybe uh, younger students and maybe uh, slightly lower language level, we may want to skip steps one, two and three, and just get them some reading made challenges and maybe proposed situations uh, so that we can scaffold the activity a bit more. Moving on, we, we may want to, after groups have worked, uh, we may want to facilitate an open class discussion on how learning and well-being will benefit from collaboration, peer support, and of course, personalized learning. We're gonna look at how um, setting individual objectives as well is gonna play an important role and uh, personalized learning is going to be key. Of course, we will also want to explain, uh, maybe not as part of this activity, but we definitely want to make sure that at the very beginning of uh, the new school year, uh, we, we give students an opportunity to be fully involved and um, aware of what is going to happen, what is the plan moving forward, so that we have a shared vision and a vision uh, that they also collaborate in creating alongside with us as teachers. And of course, creating the right mindset, as Fabio said, um, we can do some practical uh, activities to do that. Um, for example, creating a mot motivation wall. So if you're teaching in the classroom, you might have a poster on the wall where the students can write. And if you want to have a digital alternative, using a tech tool like Padlet may be more appropriate. What we want to do is encourage that, um, that students are looking at the positive elements of their work and the week, and that they share some kind of motivational message each week. Um, so it's thinking of that positive mindset. Also, um, the shout out activity, 
um, which might be shout out on Friday or shout on, out on Thursday, depends where you are in the world, or even maybe shout out on Saturday, depending on your school week. But the idea is to get students to stop for a moment, to really reflect on what the highlights of the week and to, to, to um, talk about something they've done well, perhaps write a message of thanks to someone, to, to their teacher or to another peer who's helped them. And then of course, they can transfer that to the motivation wall. Some of you may be, um, have been in the session with Iris B this morning, and she has other ideas about how you can create mindset. So you may like to look at that session. So another thing I, we wanted to point out to you, which you might find a, as a useful tool going back into the classroom, are some new lesson plans which get students to reflect on um, lockdown. And they are already made. So for, from the teacher's point of view, you can use that uh, uh, to help guide your lesson and to obviously uh, do a variety of tasks. So you can see here the QR code. It's also included in the, the list that Fabia refers to. So um, you can download these and use them or adapt them to your situation as you prefer. Thank so. you very much, Sarah. So uh, yeah, so having established the importance of step one, so making sure we, uh, we set up our right uh, positive mindsets and uh, we, we kind of build a, a bit of a team spirit with our students. Uh, we're now going to move on and talk about the different roles and key roles that assessment will play for us and the different techniques that will allow us to uh, get assessment to support us from the very beginning and throughout our learning pathway. Sarah, so, back to you again. Yeah, so um, as we said, some students will have been disadvantaged and or been struggling with their learning remotely, and while others may have blossomed. So the problem for us, of course, is to establish what those differences are. So I want to look at um, a range of, um, very briefly, I must say, um, a range of uh, activities using incorporating assessment into, into your classroom to look at those gaps. I think um, the teacher has tools possibly in their course book. So you may have some diagnostic um, with, uh, testing materials. You may have um, other uh, uh, progress test materials, etc. Now, what's different about diagnostic testing perhaps this year is that we need to particularly focus on the learning that took place during lockdown or didn't take place. So if you've got students struggling, you obviously need to see um, the disparity if there is in your group. So a diagnostic test that you may have in your book may cover certain the, the material that you were used while you were in lockdown, and you might want to focus on those areas to see how well your students managed to, to, uh, to cover that at a distance. Now, the important thing about assessment is that we need to see it as formative, as something that we can understand uh, where the gaps are um, so that we can move forward. And it needs really to be incorporated as a part of our course all the time. It's not just about having test points. It's about using assessment information to help learning. So what we find out about the strengths and weaknesses of our students, of course, then feeds back into what we're doing in the class. And it may be different for different students. So that's what's very important. Now, I put feedback with formative assessment because, of course, it's going to be essential that students are getting continuous feedback. So if you're using, if you're integrating uh, assessment into your lessons, perhaps informally as well as formally, then uh, your students need to get the feedback to see how they're progressing. Because assessment, as we all know, is, is not just about correcting mistakes. Uh, it's really about informing the teacher, but also informing the learner. Um, and I think we can integrate certain tasks into evaluation, of evaluation tasks, which will highlight where students are having difficulty or perhaps even finding it easy. So that gap, I mean, this is something we would normally do in our classroom anyway, but I think it's just highlighted, the need is highlighted by this lockdown period. So the other thing to say is that if your learners are aware that the teacher is regularly evaluating, perhaps recording the performance in, um, to show progress, not just about mistakes, and giving feedback continually, it might also help them engage better 
with that learning process. Now, we can talk about formal testing and informal testing. It might be something from your course book. It might be using a practice test for an exam preparation, but it could also be something that you create yourself. So you might um, personalize a test and use a tool like Google Forms, which also allows you to automatically um, mark the, the, the quiz that you create. Something like Socrative.com is similar and it helps you with the testing format. Um, also, I think we need to look at some of the apps like Quizlet, uh, Kahoot, which are um, usually uh, well, they're used in a variety of ways, but can also inform that testing process um, um, for the student themselves, but also obviously for the teachers. So there's a range of, of material, but basically what we're trying to do is find out what those gaps are um, and then move forward. Now, Fabio's got a very practical uh, task here, so. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, as you rightly pointed out, uh, uh, we are, first of all, uh, going to uh, do diagnostic assessment, carry out diagnostic assessment, so that we can easily identify those gaps. And, uh, and also, as you rightly said, uh, gaps uh, may not all apply to the old class as a group. Some will, some would, some will only apply to different students. This is why, apart from setting objectives for the old class, after the diagnostic assessment, it will be very important also to uh, set individual objectives. Uh, we refer to them as IOs from now on. So we want to get uh, students involved in compiling a document stating their individual objectives. As we said earlier, it's very important that students play a very proactive role in um, and the aware of what uh, the learning pathway will look like. So we want to make sure as well that uh, objectives are agreed, as we're saying, but also achievable and measurable. And we want to include some practical tasks as well as learning strategies in the learning agreement. Uh, of course, time is a challenge. The amount of things that we learn uh, are probably more than they would usually be as we need to catch up on things we may have missed out on last year. And this is why we need to give students would support in terms of helping them to optimize their study time and their learning tools. So let's look at an example. This is just a, a grid we put together and uh, it's uh, also going to be available uh, for you to as a reference uh, in the, um, for the final QR code at the end of this presentation will be part of the resources shared. So um, this is a very simple grid, uh, homemade. But uh, so learning, uh, we, we're dividing this in uh, learning areas. So, for example, we may have identified that for a specific learner or maybe a small group of learners, um, clothes as a vocabulary item are, weren't really um, learned as much as, it, as we would like to. Um, so, in the second column, we give students, uh, we say that objectives should be, should be measurable. So we need to establish some criteria and so we give students some idea on, ideas on how to self-assess, uh, uh, do some self-assessment, evaluate themselves. So we're doing this year with the STAR system, we could uh, use emoticons as well. Then we obviously want to set the objectives, that's what we were talking about. So um, it's important that we agree this with students. This will be a document that students will use throughout the year. We will uh, want to establish a deadline, so maybe we, we're going back to that uh, after maybe the first semester or so, or maybe it will just be every two months. This is something we need to kind of reflect on. And as we mentioned earlier, learning strategies are important. We need to support them. So um, we have a last column about how to do, how to achieve the objectives we are agreeing upon. And uh, obviously, even also for this activity, scaffolding will be important depending on level and age. So, for example, with higher level students, more mature students, uh, the last column about learning strategies could be something the students come up with in groups. Or for maybe younger, lower level students, we may suggest some, uh, maybe a list of learning strategies that they can choose and maybe um, rank in sort of a hierarchy and choose their own preferred learning strategy. Right, so moving on. So uh, in fact, following on from you, Fabio, a document like that, of course, encourages students to become more self-aware 
Um, we, if we want our students to become more independent and better learners, if you like, because they're more aware of their weaknesses and strengths, a document then like that also um, provides a sense of progress as they complete those learning objectives. Um, so it's seen rather not as, as something positive that helps them um, see that path of progress. Um, we do need to help our learners understand, as I've said before, about their own strengths and weaknesses. So they need to be guided in this, of course. It takes time to, to realize that the responsibility is also the learners, not just the teachers. And so we need to give them tools to be able to do that. Um, I think if we help students to um, or share criteria, we share assessment criteria, we explain how they're um, being assessed so that they can see their own strengths and weaknesses. And it's also quite important to see that they can see it in a written form. So also that the, the, the chart that Fabio showed helps because it's written and you've got a record. But also with assessment, they actually need to see what they're being assessed, how they're being assessed and understand how that works so that they can see patterns in their own work and perhaps help them identify uh, what they need to work on. Obviously, with younger students, it's going to be um, slightly more, uh, less ambitious. But again, as Fabio said, using emoticons, using stars, etc., starts that um, awareness. And so self-awareness is really something we uh, really want to foster in our learners, particularly at this time. And it means that they're going to be more likely to use the time well that they have available. Now, we can start with very small steps, so emoticons, stars, or whatever, so self-evaluation using that, but also even doing a confidence check, which, if you like, is a self-evaluation, because at the beginning of a lesson, week, or the beginning of a week, or, or whatever, you may ask your students to reflect about how confident they feel. Now, one of the problems with um, lockdown is that a lot of students will have lost their confidence and may not want to talk about it or, sh or uh, may not feel that they can. Whereas we have to actually, if we allow them to do that, make space for it, then hopefully they can see, yes, it's okay that I didn't really understand that. I did it in a remote situation. I didn't really hear all the lesson because the internet wasn't working properly, whatever. So I do think we need to allow space for students to acknowledge the difficulty that they might have had um, during lockdown. And then, of course, keeping on a positive note, let's look towards the progress. So again, hopefully, having reviewed it, over the, uh, they can see some sense of progress and, and, and gain more confidence. Now, that's on a very simple level. Um, we can start to use tools. We mentioned a few um, earlier, but we can also start to use tools like uh, Write and Improve. Um, if you haven't discovered it, this is a fantastic tool. It's all, it encourages writing skills, helps students develop their writing skills. And for teachers, it's fantastic because it auto marks. So um, absolutely fantastic. But it's at different levels and uh, you can choose different tasks according to the needs of your and interests of your students. Or you can even create your own. So this um, allows you to ask your students to complete a task. Um, this is just an example we have on the the left writing a report they will write complete the task and write on the right in the in the space on the left they will click the computer send it to write and improve and write and improve in 15 seconds will send back some feedback now we said the it's very important for students to have feedback writing is a particularly challenging area for, for teachers to get feedback um, if you've got a lot of students writing to mark, but this tool enables students to uh, get feedback very quickly. Now, some of you may know the app Grammarly. Grammarly corrects everything. This Write and Improve is a learning tool and encourages students to look at their writing again. It gives them some tips on what, where they have perhaps could improve. Um, they can look at those tips and I'll just show you on the next slide so it's a bit bigger so you can see the kind of feedback um, it gives to the students. It doesn't correct everything, that's not the idea. It's a learning tool and the students can look at those um, uh, areas, suggestions, make the corrections and send it again to the computer uh, and get some more feedback and they can continue to do that. Once um, you, then they can send it perhaps to the teacher for the final evaluation. 
So it's getting students involved in that process and becoming more self-aware, engaging um, in, in that uh, learning process, which I find very exciting um, with this particular tool. So that kind of takes us on to thinking about if you're aware of your of looking at criteria for your own work and you're beginning to feel more confident about what is expected, um, it's, it's, it's clear that when you start to look at your peers of the um, assessment, um, using peer assessment, um, students um, actually find their own work improves because if they're looking at other people's writing using the criteria, they start to understand those criteria better. So um, it's, it's uh, really very motivating. Now, I think Fabio's actually got another practical activity here. So yes, I do, Sarah. One. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, so as we are talking about uh, peer assessment, uh, just uh, suggesting one potential activity you could do is a sort of framework. So um, we're gonna show you in a second uh, our, a peer review form. So we can use these to assess both writing or speaking. Uh, the way we would use these, we would uh, um, put students in groups of three. One will be the one assessed, so the one will present his or her work. And then the other two members of the group will, have, uh, will be assigned to different roles. So one will be called the reviewer, and that's going to be the person who looks for content. Another one will be the editor who looks for structure. So that would be uh, specifically for writing, uh, but it could also obviously apply to speaking. And of course, uh, as you can see from this form, uh, very easy to recreate and personalize as well. Uh, we will want to make sure the students understand a very basic principle of giving feedback, which is we do want uh, to provide positive feedback uh, as a starting point uh, so that we create the right mindset again and positive sort of uh, uh, collaborative uh, um, situation and environment. So um, as, we, as we do that, uh, it's very important for us uh, to also establish uh, the criteria that we want our students to, uh, to use when they're evaluating their peers. So we tell us something more about that. Yes, so um, looking at criteria um, for writing, for example, um, this, is the, this is available for teachers in the teacher's um, handbook for, uh, in the Cambridge English qualifications at all levels, actually. Um, we want to make it uh, stu more student-friendly or more accessible to students, help them understand what that criteria is. Perhaps we choose one of the elements to ask them to look at their peers' work um, so that um, obviously it's, it, they can focus on that, the, uh, the important aspects of one of those rather than trying to do all of it. Um, and uh, using, as Fabio said, helping them to learn how to give feedback, um, being constructive um, and obviously looking for positives and not just looking about grammar correction, for example. And um, I, uh, I would just like to mention some of the new um, tools available for teachers, particularly related to writing. There is a, a guide for teachers. Um, it's actually A2, B1, B2. Um, and it has some tips for how you might carry out, uh, encourage your students to do self-assessment and peer assessment. And one of those things, as Fabio says, is making sure that you understand the criteria and how you're applying it to your peer. At lower levels, of course, it can be much less sophisticated. It might be just annotating if you're viewing it online, putting a star, putting an um, emoticon where you find something in the student's work that is positive. Um, this, of course, uh, takes you to um, looking at the Cambridge English qualifications, but obviously there are other things that we can look at criteria for. You may create your own depending on the work you're doing. This is an example um, of student uh, um, peer feedback um, using Padlet as a tool. And I'd like to thank um, my, co my colleague, Nicole Bouvelot from Rome for sharing this Padlet with me. Um, and this, her students have uh, done an essay and they have commented on their peers. She again has guided them on, on the criteria and this is the kind of thing that you can do. So um, you can also do this for speaking. Um, you could do a speaking activity and a similarly and put it on a Padlet and people can give feedback on speaking too. So there are lots of ideas that you, where you could use the same principle, um, not just for writing. 
And of course, there's a QR code to take you to that uh, if you'd like to. So very quickly, just to take you to our website um, to show you some of the tools that are now available and the understanding your learners' levels and needs. So perfect for this topic. Um, these are um, newly available and uh, you can download some various um, um, resources, including sample papers from the Cambridge English Qualifications, which might help you identify um, some of the strengths for their skills and relevant to, um, to those levels. Obviously, the confidence checks we talked about. And there are also some resources if you need to have um, material for fast finishers, because of course you've got this disparity um, in your class, etc. And also a little, a little bit more about feedback. So let's move on to the student, Fabio. Yeah, sure. So uh, we said at the beginning that one of the things we have to make sure we optimize is the use of resources. We also say that our most important, important resource in the classroom is our learners. So uh, we believe that uh, um, the best way to give our learners a, a, ch a chance to, to shine and to support each other is to put them to work in groups and to um, facilitate and foster peer support. So let's have a look at a way we, we could do that uh, as an activity. So um, first thing, well, but before doing that, sorry, uh, let's look at some advantages. Um, well, peer support, group work is something that will help us save time. So as a student uh, work in groups, uh, we as teachers have the time to go around, monitor, support uh, individual personalized learning, as well as uh, yeah, provide uh, individual feedback and potentially evaluate and assess our students. Working in groups also reduces anxiety. So students, uh, they produce language in front of a smaller, more reduced groups, a group of people, which means uh, uh, they would probably feel more confident and encouraged to use the language. Working in groups also contributes to strengthen, strengthen relationships through collaboration, as well as giving students greater chance to use the language. Group work uh, in also increases students' participation and involvement, because of course they've got more opportunities to, to use the language and to speak as they don't want to take too many turns. And it enhances learners' autonomy and level of responsibility, as Sarah earlier outlined the importance of these. Right, so if we move on, we'll to have a look at an activity as I anticipated earlier. Uh, we are going to try again and assign students to groups. We may want to do three to five uh, learners in a single group. And the objective of this will be to either create a review poster or a student-led lesson. So it's very important that we assign roles to group members so that will help uh, the fact that everyone in the group will have something to do and potentially we may avoid one of the uh, cri critical aspects which is sometimes when you work in groups uh, not all students are involved uh, enough. We will then assign each group a topic and they will have, as I said earlier, to prepare a review poster or, um, a, or a lesson. So after they've done that and of course we will have uh, uh, be going around, we will have uh, we will have supported them and uh, provided ideas and maybe helped them to structure that well. After that, um, students will be asked to present in groups the lesson they've created or the post they've created to the whole class. And uh, also to provide their peers with a, a chance to practice what they've just uh, presented. And they could even help the teacher to monitor the activity and to administer the activity in the classroom. So I'd say that uh, was our last activity, wasn't it, Sarah? Unfortunately, yep. we've run out of time. We have. <laughs> yeah. And so, let's sum up. Let's sum up, Fabio. So, uh, okay. So. Just summing up, yeah. Uh, I think the three main points we would like you to take away is the importance of establishing a positive mindset so that we can all work well as a group and support each other. The importance of using assessment to identify gaps and support learning. And it's not just about test points, it's using it continuously to help learning. And the last? Absolutely. And peer support in group work, as we've just mentioned, will help our learners as well as it will help you as teachers 
and uh, it's going to be a key area um, to, to focus on for, for all of us. Last thing is that there's a uh, last QR code that we'll try to leave on for a second. So uh, using this QR code, you will access documents where all of the links and QR codes that we share during the presentation are summed up in this final one. So uh, please feel free to take a picture of this. And I think uh, now it's time for questions, if any. Indeed. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you very much, Fabio. Um, a lot of activity there in the chat window. So we've got a lot of questions and only about four minutes. So I'm going to fire them at you. Um, the first one, quite a fundamental one and interesting one. Um, should I engage in diagnostic testing if I can't actually do much differentiated teaching because we have to work through the course book and have large classes? So what's the point in testing if you're going to have to teach a certain curriculum anyway? Well, that's a very interesting question. And of course, I think it is a hard one. I, we have to acknowledge that challenge. But I do think it's important for teachers to, to, to try to understand what, where their students are. They may find that there are opportunities to do individualized feedback or give them activities outside the classroom if that's possible, or encourage them to use self-access resources. So I do think um, it's important for the teachers to be aware of those gaps. Yeah, and also diagnostic assessment will not only inform individual objectives, but also class objectives. So, of course, there's a curriculum to, you know, be done and completed, but we need to make sure that we haven't missed out on anything that is really important to do that. So, identifying the gaps is very important, also for the group as a whole. Okay, super. Thank you very much. Um, here's a, an interesting question from uh, Vinicius Tavares. How about the Dunning-Kruger effect? People are usually unreliable in assessing their own skills. So this was when you were talking about self-assessment. Should, should I go? You start. All right. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, um, I suppose that um, that is something that we do need to acknowledge, and uh, of course, self-assessment uh, is something that. It is an activity that uh, students will carry out, but they will be monitored and supported with the teacher. This is also why we talked about uh, learning agreement. So it's the teacher's point of view and the student's point of view. So it's just a learning tool, but it does not substitute teacher assessment. It's, it's part of the assessment work we do. And I would just say, yes, it supports uh, teacher assessment. And some students will find self-assessment more challenging. I think different age groups, also nationality, make a difference to um, your approach to learning. But I think the more we can guide our students so that they can become more independent in the long term, the, it's worth it to do it just perhaps in small steps, not, don't, not expect them to do too much too quickly. Yeah, also I think, if I may add, uh, um, self-assessment may sometimes help us perfect diagnostic assessment, as maybe some students will have not performed their best for that specific topic uh, while doing diagnostic assessment, but they have a chance to show through the criteria we provide that they actually maybe know that specific topic slightly better than we had kind of uh, assumed uh, looking at the result of diagnostic testing. And I also think that if they use digital tools, sometimes they don't actually think of it as self-assessment, but actually they're looking at the score, they're looking at how they can improve the score, they're seeing it as a game. So if you like, it's gamification of, of assessment can also be a positive way for students to take on that, uh, that challenge of doing some self-assessment. Super, okay, thank you. And relatedly, um, a number of questions ar around peer assessment and peer review. Um, Cam asks, can peer review work for learners who are weak in the language? And someone else asks as well, is there a minimum level at which peer review can be done? Okay, um, I was going to say the level of, the, it depends what kind of peer review you're asking. Um, Fabio showed stars and we talked about emoticons. So you don't have to have necessarily have to write, a, um, write a, um, any feedback or speak feedback. You can actually just indicate it or annotate it if you're using online materials. So from that point of view, you can even you can start very young as well. Um, so it really depends on the kind of, uh, of peer review that you're asking them to, to carry out. Absolutely, and I think for weaker students, uh, the important thing is that we provide them with the tools. We make sure we scaffold every peer review activity as much as we can. And there's no student so that's too weak to do peer assessment. It's going to be beneficial for everyone. It's important that we support them in doing that. That is the key. Okay, super. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. 
Thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you very much, Fabio, and thank you all uh, very much for attending the session. Um, 